Welcome back to our Wednesday night Bible study for the Woodlands Church of Christ of Psalm 119, the Psalm of the Word. I hope you've enjoyed this series of studies presented by myself and several other men in the congregation, and I appreciate all of their efforts. And tonight we conclude that study in the last two sections of eight verses from verse 161 to the end. As we noted through the study, traditionally David is considered the author of Psalm 119, although there's some reason to believe the possibility that this may have been a psalm of Jeremiah. And as we conclude in this section, the very first statement in verse 161 lends more toward the idea of it being David simply because of the fact that princes um, persecuted him without cause but that could have been Jeremiah too but having said that what I really want us to reflect on as we conclude the psalm is how the psalmist portrays himself in relationship to God and his word it should be noted that the psalmist is writing of course in the old covenant of the Old Testament. As a Jew, a follower of God through the covenant of Moses, he exhibits all throughout this psalm um, over and over and over again declarations of praise for God, of course, but great confidence in his relationship with God. 
when we come to the New Testament for us, there is sometimes a, an assumption that we make that now that the gospel has come to its fruition, the, uh, the bloom has flowered, if you will, and the result of Jesus Christ, the, the final conclusion, the final declaration from God, the um, untelling, I'm sorry, the unveiling, I should say, of the story that God has been telling has now come about. That when we see what God has done for us in Christ Jesus through his grace and his mercy, we emphasize rightly that a believer should have great confidence before God. And the writer of Hebrews says that we should come before the throne of God with confidence because of Jesus Christ, our great high priest. It is John who will say that uh, he hears us and we should have confidence that whatever we ask in his name, he hears us. Uh, it would be Paul who would describe in Romans chapter 8 the great confidence that he feels because and we all should feel because of the gospel and God's wonderful working of bringing Messiah to, wor to the world. But that isn't as if people in the Old Covenant had no confidence. And the psalmist has great confidence in his relationship with God, probably to the same degree every Christian should. In fact, we'll read some of the things that he says, and we might even think he might be a little bit um, uh, I want to say brag, braggadocious, which is probably a simpler word for me to say, just b being a braggart, braggy. Uh, but He's not. He's expressing his confidence in, in who God is. And it should be noted that even under the Old Testament, they had confidence with God. But here's the, the deal. Here's the connection that I want you to see. Our confidence should not rest exclusively in the fact that God has accomplished his great purpose in Jesus Christ alone. Because the psalmist has great confidence in God and what God can accomplish in his life, but through the word that God has given under the Mosaic Covenant, the revelation of God's message, and maybe even to some degree the revelation that is seen naturally in the world that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 1. So as a Christian, you and I come to the same real realization that you and I have this great confidence because of what God has accomplished for us in Christ, but through his word. Yes, the living word, that is Jesus Christ who came in the flesh, but also the living and abiding word, which is the word of God, which, which will not undergo decay. And so we should have this same connection with what the psalmist says and says about himself what he says about what he's facing, uh, what he says about uh, what he thinks of God, and will say what he believes about the Word. Those, all of those things should connect to us and reveal to us, especially, what it is we should know about ourselves. So let's finish, beginning in verse 161. Princes persecute me without cause. But my heart stands in awe of thy words. I rejoice at thy word. As one who finds great spoil, I hate and despise falsehood, but I love thy law. Seven times a day I praise you because of thy righteous ordinances. And those who love thy law have great peace, and nothing causes them to stumble. I hope for your salvation, O Lord, and do thy commandments. My soul keeps thy testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. I keep thy precepts and thy testimonies, for all my ways are before thee. Let me cry before thee, or let me cry, I'm sorry, let my cry come before thee, O Lord. Give me understanding according to thy word. Let my supplication come before thee. Deliver me according to thy word. Let my lips utter praise, 
For thou dost teach me thy statutes, let my tongue sing of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. Let thy hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen thy precepts. I long for thy salvation, O Lord, and thy delight, and thy law is my delight. Let my soul live, that it may pre praise thee, and let thine ordinances help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for I do not forget thy commandments. So, it is a great finish to the psalm as the psalmist reflects upon himself before God and his word. But notice in verse 161, he has great respect for God's law. Notice verse 162, he has great joy. Verse 163, he rejoices in that truth that is found not only in his word, but truth in the world. And he rejoices in that truth. He loves God's law. He um, praises God. And he says seven times a day. And of course, that really doesn't have to mean <laughs> that he counts out seven times a day and says, I praise you, God, or seven times he sings a song, although that would be included in what he's saying. But of course, again, he's using a figure of speech to describe the totality of his life. Seven times a day, I praise you. This is my life, Lord. I praise you every day. I praise you all day long. Uh, as Paul told the Thessalonians, um, pray continually. Uh, pray without ceasing. Let our praises to God never end, is what the psalmist is saying about himself. Seven times a day, I praise you. Notice in verse 166, his hope is in God's salvation. His obedience is gifted, um, sorry, is a response to God's gift in his testimonies. He obeys, he observes, he says, I do them, and I love them exceedingly. I, I don't know that this is a, but to me as an American, this kind of connects with things I've heard the, uh, I'm going to say it, the younger generation say <laughs> I can't believe I said that. Anyway, I love them exceedingly. I love, love, love. I love, love, love. I mean, that's, that's what he's saying. Exceedingly, I love your law. I love your words. And for all my ways are before you. He's not extolling himself like he's some kind of super believer. Even though all of us would look probably at some of those descriptions and think and recognize and as perhaps a weakness or a shortcoming but still he acknowledges that before God God can see right through him God knows who he is for all my ways are before you so he cries to God verse 169 he uh, prays through his supplication he praises he he sings with his song and there is the real application of what faith means to the psalmist. It's not an acceptance. It is an action. I, I pray, I sing, I, I praise, I cry, I rejoice. And, and, and there is this ever-present action in the life of the believer as he relates to the word. That, that's what the psalmist is. If you are a believer, the word does that to you. And so the first application is to us as Christians. It's great to study the Bible every day. It's great to de devote a, a, de a specific time, whether it is in the evening uh, to study. Um, but that devotion must not be mechanical. It must not be driven by merely a calendar. It must be driven by the heart. That even I can relate to moments when perhaps I get away from studying the Bible devotionally. And let me use this illustration. I remember a long time ago when I first started preaching, an older preacher 
when asked what would be his best advice to us young preachers that were sitting around talking with him, what was his best advice? And he said, study your Bible for your Bible classes. Um, study your Bible for your sermons. But you better study the Bible for you. I'm not sure that I grasped then what he meant. Um, but I sure, what he, I sure know what he means now. Is that faith is personal. Not in the sense that it can't be evaluated by the Word of God, but it's personal. It's my person with God, trusting Him. Acknowledging before God, my, my ways are before you. And I want you to notice that when the psalmist concludes the entire psalm, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for, thy, for I do not forget thy commandments. Lord, you know who I am. I, I don't forget your commandments, but I still stray. I still sin. I still falter. And the psalmist is not seeking excuse for his misdeeds. But he is asking God to keep seeking him. Pursue me. Um, I think I read somewhere someone said, God, please hunt me down. <laughs> I think that might be too strong a word because hunt me down implies something like you're, you're searching with the intent of vengeance or um, the intent to kill. And that's not God's disposition. But the psalmist says, Lord, seek me out. Do, when I'm faltering, and I know that I do, come to me and straighten me out. A true believer and a Christian today should have that very strong and consistent sentiment that they want to be exposed to the truth of God's word at all times. So many times we try to self-justify. So many times we try to get people on our side or whatever the deal is. But God's word always speaks truth. And we should acknowledge our weaknesses and quit Casting all of our blame on everyone else when we can look upon ourselves as the psalmist does and acknowledge Even though I love the Lord thy God with all of my heart I have gone astray like a lost sheep And so he he talks about a verse 161 he doesn't talk often about in this section of um, oppression or persecution, but um, he does in 161, princes persecute me without cause. In other words, it's unjust persecution, at least from his perspective. He also says in verse 169 that I cry, let my cry come before you, O Lord, and give me understanding. Notice he'll say also in 173, let your hand be ready to help me. And verse 175, how does God's hand do that? The second part of that, let thine ordinances help me. So he, he knows that the only way God ultimately helps him, even though there's a providential reality about how God works in our lives, God's going to work in us through the word. I think it's Jim Cope who called um, the book of James the wonderful word worker. That making the word of God work in your life. You need to feel compassion. Let the word of God help you. You need to confess your wickedness. Let the word of God help you. What, whatever it is that we struggle with, the word of God is there to guide us. And so many times if we focus all of the attention on what the word is saying to us, not that we should never point out error in our brothers and sisters, but I can guarantee you the fighting and the, the main, maiming that oftentimes goes on in the name of religion in our world would stop if we'd let the word of God lay bare our open heart. Because what God knows is everything. And that's why he says in 165, those who love your law have great peace and nothing causes them to stumble. It's not saying that the, they'll never sin, but stumble so as to forever fall is the significance. It's, it's not stumble and then get right back up again. 
But God's never going to leave us down. That's why he's going to come to our aid. He's going to come to our help. There have been times, I'm sure, in every one of our lives when we've wandered farther and farther and farther away from God and we wonder how we got there or we wonder how we could ever get back. But the psalmist's confidence was, I have this great peace. Not, not peace because I'm perfect, but peace because nothing will ever cause me to forever fall. I may, but no thing. And that's why Paul would reiterate the same confidence as he concludes Romans chapter 8, that God gives us the victory in Christ. It's not as if that isn't a confidence the psalmist feels because what the psalmist feels and knows is that God is not going to leave him in spite of his weakness and failures, in spite of his righteousness and good doing. God will always be there for him and God will always be there for you and for me because that's what the psalmist believes. He doesn't believe in himself. He believes in God. And the confidence that exudes all throughout the Psalms and all throughout this psalmist's um, wonderful working of the Word, the Psalm about the Word, is that it is all about God. He will be the one ready to help you. He has chosen to show us His precepts, His commandments, His righteous works so that you and I could be guided in light, led away from darkness, so that we could love, experience peace, know joy, and live lives full of praise. So tonight, I want that part of the psalm to exhort you. It's great to read the Gospels and see Jesus' interaction and how he worked to accomplish the purpose of his Father and our God. It is fantastic to read how the Acts records Christians carrying out the work of the gospel in, in all sorts of places and witnessing Peter and Paul and, and John and, and even James and their great displays of faith. We can go to the Old Testament and look at the great heroes and heroines of faith like the writer of Hebrews does to help Christians that he's writing to keep pressing on. But what is to be pressed toward is God. And the psalmist reminds us again and again, while the sum of your word is truth, it's because you are truth. Your righteous ordinances guide me in every right way. So make the word part of you and work that word in your life. Let's all stop making excuses. Let's all stop saying uh, it's too hard to understand. The more that we apply, the more that we read, the more that we listen, the more God's word will illuminate your way. Thank you so much for joining me uh, tonight. Uh, this is the end of the study of the Psalm of the Word. There is one more Wednesday night without um, a specific subject, but tune in for us next Wednesday. There'll be a Bible class. And then the following Wednesday in September, September 2nd, we'll resume a Wednesday night class in person with a uh, seating that's uh, spatially appropriate. And, and safe for people that are present, but we will continue to live stream as well um, those studies so that if you are unable to be with us, you can partake and participate in this way. I hope you've been blessed and may God bless you where you are.